one of my favorite uh, shows that I like to watch is actually a reality TV baking contest show. You may have heard of it. It's called The Great British Bake Off. Twelve contestants from across all of England are brought together. They're amateur bakers, and they compete each week, first of all, for the title of star baker, and each week one person goes home. At the end of the contest, and it runs for weeks or for a long time, then the winner is the greatest British baker, so to speak. And, of course, in a cooking competition, they're judged on their skill, their competency. They're judged on their proficiency, their efficiency, their ability to cook. I mean, if they can't cook, what's the point? And, of course, uh, they actually have different recipes, some of their own. And then they also have other things that uh, they are required to bake. And, of course, my favorite part of the show is the technical challenge. Now, in the technical challenge, each contestant has the same recipe. Each contestant has the same ingredients. They have the same utensils, the same uh, kitchenette stoves. They have the same time. And they're given that opportunity to show just how well they can, A, pay attention, B, follow directions. One of the judges is a guy by the name of Paul Hollywood. Yes, that's his real name. I checked, I Googled it already. Uh, Paul Hollywood and his associate, Prue, uh, he's a celebrity chef. She is also a chef, but also a business person. And they come together. There's some other people who are announcers on the show just for dramatic effect, obviously. But they're the ones who know their business. And so he told them not long ago, I watched it when he wanted them to do 12, 12 coconut macaroons. Now, as an aside, that would be a wonderful Saturday afternoon volunteer uh, assignment just for show up and say, I would love to be a taste tester judge because each judge, they have to try each contestant's cook uh, each, each time. They sometimes do pastries and pies and puddings and cakes and other times different menu items, but lately it's been more of the holiday food, hence uh, the holiday emphasis, so it's been, uh, it's been kind of fattening because I, I end up eating chocolate chip cookies and other stuff I have on hand watching that show. It's, it's terribly uh, not healthy for me, but I love to watch it just because of the technical skill that goes into that. Twelve coconut macaroons, six of them were to be custard filled, I'm not so sure about that, and the other, the other six had chocolate chocolate piping, chocolate icing. It would be wonderful on my plate with a big old cup of French roast coffee. That's awesome. I would love that. But the thing that struck me the most was when Paul Hollywood told the contestants, it is imperative that you, number one, follow the recipe, that you don't skimp on the ingredients, that you don't skip any steps in the process, and that you don't crimp on your time. If you're going to have a plate of macaroons, that is textbook perfect. You know, life is a lot like that technical challenge, especially Christian life. And we are told in the scriptures that we've been looking at this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, that we are given in Christ everything we need for a recipe for a fruitful faith. And therefore, we are set up to win. We're set up to succeed. The Holy Spirit is both resource, he's also our coach, our prompter, our director, our producer. However you want to word that, he's there for us so that the church as a whole, we can be fruitful. And as Christians individually, we can be fruitful. That is awesome. We're not just persevering to just trudge through and endure with a grim, sour face. No. We, we may do those things on occasion because life can be hard, but we also persevere because we are already victorious in Jesus Christ and we can be fruitful. The Bible tells us in John chapter 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Yes, in Christ you and I, we can have a fruitful faith. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. John chapter 15, verse 8 as well in that same passage. So as we go back to the passage in Peter, Peter is talking to the church that he has written to that's facing some very difficult times. Persecution and problems 
hostility and it seems hopelessness oppression on every side and he says look yeah you've got hard times yeah you've got difficult times but you have the recipe that you need the ingredients that you need to have a fruit filled faith no questions asked even now and if that was true in Peter's day it is true in our day in that passage that I read I want us to look at first of all the resource when you're having that technical challenge on the on the baking show it's all under this big checkered uh, I guess it's a kitchen towel some years it's uh, red and white check sometimes it's blue and white check it just depends they're going for a kitchen theme I guess and so you take it off and you have everything you need and there's the recipe and it's up to you to be able to produce whatever it is they're asking you to cook well as you think about that those are the resources if you don't have the resources you may have the will you may have the energy you may have the enthusiasm but if you ain't got the resources you ain't got a thing Okay, so there you have it. So we have resources. Number one, there's divine power. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God's power is the crucial catalyst. It's His authority. It's His ability applied on our behalf, which we then get to live out. That's awesome. Everything that we need that pertains to life. Now that word life, it is both the spiritual life, obviously, but also the physical life. Eternal life, that relationship with Jesus Christ, it is including living forever and ever for all eternity. That's the, that's the icing on the cake. But the cake itself, yes, using the baking motif, uh, the cake itself is the ability to live that victorious and vital life right here, right now, from here to eternity. That is that essential life that is in view. And we have everything we need for a fruitful faith starting right here to eternity and beyond. And then the things that pertain to godliness. That is one's inner response to, to God. A godly heart response. A reverence for the Lord. It is, it is that putting into your, your life, putting into practice what you say you believe and, and what you say you think and feel. It's easy to talk a good game, but it's living out that game if you want to use a game analogy. Or if you're using a baking analogy, oh, I'm the best baker there is. Well, okay, fine. Show me. Show me your proficiency at the table. Show me how well you follow the directions. Show me that you have the experience that you can put it in the oven and take it out at the precise timing. I've always told my wife, I'm going to cook you a uh, Mediterranean meatloaf. I can cook when I want to, people. I mean, it, it is what it is, you know. Um, uh, especially if it's microwavable or if it's one of those instant things. I'm awesome with that. Too bad I can't be judged on that. I, I could probably rack up. But yeah, I guess I can cook when I really put my mind to it. But you know what? If I don't have, and I did Google it and I haven't found one yet, if I don't have a recipe for a Mediterranean meatloaf, ground beef or turkey, my will might be, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to do it anyway. But if I don't have a recipe and don't have directions and ingredients I can follow, it's probably not going to turn out well. That's that idea that we have putting it into practice. If I say, oh, I can cook it, then yeah, I need to probably have a little bit of experience of putting one of those together, trying it, maybe trial and error, maybe come up with my own recipe so that eventually I could serve it to y'all at a fellowship sometime. However, it's going to be a while before we look at a Mediterranean meatloaf because I've not found a recipe out there at all. But God has given us everything we need for a fruitful faith. There's number two, divine knowledge. Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Knowledge here is not just academic, although that's a good place to start. Okay, And then it's not just churchy knowledge. All of us can probably talk church all day long, although that's a good place to start. It's, it's not church knowledge. It's not religious knowledge. It's not just theology or doctrine. Those things are important and they have their place. No, the knowledge that we're talking about is a first-hand knowledge, a, a, a personal relationship knowledge that says not only taking what you know about Christ, but knowing Christ personally and living that out. God has given that to us in the person of Jesus Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit. A personal knowledge and a love relationship that is by grace through faith lived out, not just to make heaven miss, miss hell, but to live life even now amid a pandemic 
that which is real, that which may be a bunch of fear and a little bit of in-between. We're given what we need to live a fruitful life right here, right now, in Chunky and at Chunky Baptist Church. The genuine Christian is eternally secure in his salvation and will persevere and grow because he has everything necessary to sustain eternal life through Christ's power. Dr. John MacArthur, one of my favorite preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said, in his presence is fullness of joy. Everything you need in his absence is depth of misery. You know, we think about uh, having that recipe to follow talked about a Mediterranean meatloaf, which I have no clue how to cook, but maybe one day. But you know, you can always Google. I actually did look up Bobby Flay one time because he's supposed to have Mediterranean ideas, and I wasn't impressed. But anyway, I uh, probably shouldn't have said that on cyberspace, but it's out there now. Um, if you know somebody, let me know. I'd love to look at their recipes. But it's okay to ask. You may find uh, one of these great celebrity chefs, send in an email or something, and get a response and say, here's a recipe, try that sometime. And guess what? It helps you. Well, in our, quote, technical challenge of the spiritual life, as we are going through this time together, it is okay to ask God for wisdom. He gives it to us. He's not going to make fun of you for asking. He's not going to get on to you for asking. We're just simply to trust him that, yes, he is and he gives, not to be of double minds about that, so that we can be living that fruit-filled faith right now. This or any season, you and I have all we need to succeed, to bear spiritual fruit in our lives, and that is awesome. You have a God who's in your corner who wants you to win, who wants you to be all that you can be for Him. God's power in Christ, even this moment, this very hour, is our crucial catalyst today. Depend on Him and depend on it for that essential life right here, right now. Our personal relationship with Christ is that resource, it's also that catalyst combined. You and I are set up to succeed in Him, by Him, through Him, claim it. <coughs> Excuse me. Then there's the divine promises, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped corruption. Your translation may say depravity, that is, in the world through lust. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. A promise is something that is to be claimed. It is an assurance. Promises made in Christ, promises made by Christ, they're good. You can take it to the bank. That is where you find that, is where you find that victory because His promises have value, and value promotes vitality. <coughs> Pardon me. All the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, Amen. To the glory of God through us. 2 Corinthians 1.20 Colossians 2 verses 9 through 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In other words, you have every resource you need in Christ. So let's look at then the recipe. Because in the technical challenge contestants are given the recipe and the directions, the ingredients, and it's up to them to start putting it together, to follow the directions, to be able to do so consistently, and to do so in a way that when they take it out of the oven and they put it on their, uh, the arranging tray so that it's to be judged by Paul Hollywood and by Prue and the others, guess what? It is presentable and it is acceptable, and then the one who comes the closest to having that textbook dish, in this case, those coconut macaroons that look absolutely fantabulously awesome. The only, the only criticism I have of that, they weren't on my plate. That's the only criticism. Now, some, I mean, they ace it. It's the, the, the official ones that are produced by the experts and then the amateurs, some of them are spot on. Others, well, you know, they, they, they did fairly well. Not, not perfect, but not bad. You know, probably something like most of us would do. Then there were some, well, they're just happy to be there, aren't they? I mean, they, they give an A for effort, but that's about it. Because either they didn't follow the directions or either they cooked too long or they didn't cook long enough. It's always, it is always amazing. And yet they have everything that they need. In our faith experience, you and I have a role to play. As we have been given everything that we need in Christ, and yet God expects us to take what we've been given 
and to use it. Yes, sometimes it may be trial and error. Guess what? The Holy Spirit helps us to get back on the straight and narrow when we sometimes make a mistake. So many times we don't have to make a mistake and we can be fruitful. So let's look at the recipe then. It says, but giving all diligence, add to your faith. So as we think about adding these ingredients, diligence means employing our best efforts. Not a mm, so-so effort, not a, well, it's the best I can do. And there have been some times when I have written sermons, there have been some times when I've done work that, A, I wasn't 100% spot on or I didn't feel 100%, and so it was the best I could do at that time, so there it is. Other times, no, I'm like, and God brings me under the conviction, whatever I put my hand to do, I'm to do it to the best of my ability that he's given me, and I don't let go of it until it's put on the plate and say, okay, God, I'm stepping away, and you judge it, uh, whether it's acceptable or presentable or not, Lord, it is in your, your, uh, your purview on that. Giving our best effort always. So what are the ingredients that we're adding together? There is virtue. In essence, moral excellence. I mean, obviously, uh, it is demonstrated. It's not just saying, well, here's what I'm against, and here's what I'm for. Those are important, and you need to have some clear-cut principles in your life and let the principles that you have come from the Word of God, not from some other area, but from the Word of God. But it's the, the living out of those principles. That's one of the ingredients, that moral excellence. And then there, to that moral excellence or virtue, we're to add knowledge. Again, that first-hand experience. See, a lot of people, and it's scary, they know about Jesus Christ. They know about having a relationship. They know about worship. They know about all these things, but they don't know Christ personally. I'm reminded of a, of a coach that I, I, I worked with uh, for a long time at Benton Academy whose uh, testimony is on YouTube uh, through one of the, uh, I think, Pine Lake Church, if you ever want to Google it sometime. Ask me after church, I'll give you his name awesome men. I mean, had a tremendous testimony of how he started out knowing about Jesus Christ and he hit rock bottom with some poor choices that he made with alcohol and meth and some other things. And this is a guy I worked with, never even once thought about it. And then later on he left and it just went spiraling down. But God got a hold of his life. God brought him to that point of brokenness and in his brokenness God put him back together. He began to, to bring that spiritual healing and made his life fruitful again. He came to that knowledge, hey, I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. And he invited him to be Lord and Savior for really the very first time and has followed through on that consistently ever since. Oh, yes, now living a fruit-filled faith as we're thinking about uh, that, that idea of having uh, a personal first-hand experience, not knowing just about Jesus, but knowing Jesus this holiday season and beyond. Then there is self-control. Now, I, we think of self-control as, okay, Charles, when you're driving down the highway and somebody cuts you off on I-10 or, or whatever highway it's on, uh, you know, uh, try to be nice, you know, because that's the good thing to do. And I agree, that's the best thing to do. No, that's not just the self-control that we're thinking about. Self-control is a spirit-filled spirit-led control where our passions and our desires, the good as well as the bad, are under the control and direction of the Holy Spirit. Esau was a man literally governed by his appetite. If he were on a baking show, Esau would be one of those who's not going to have the patience to cook it. Esau would be one, I'm going to eat it right here, right now. Forget about the judges. Forget about the contest. Forget, forget about the award. I want my cake, and I want to eat it at the same time. Literally, that's kind of almost what he did. Comes in from a hunting trip. He's tired. He's famished. He's a little shaky. He sees his brother cooking a bowl of red stuff. That's what it's called in the scripture, red stuff. So I had one preacher call it uh, a, bed, a bowl of red beans, you know, uh, for a bowl of for holies. Uh, he sold his birthright. Never ever give up your birthright in Jesus Christ. But that's another sermon for another time. He comes in, he says, I gotta have it, I'm gonna die. Joseph, I'm sorry, wrong dude. Jacob looks at him, oh, let's make a deal. My bowl of red stuff, your birthright. And so he should have said, you are crazy. Birthright is something you don't trade for a bowl of beans or oatmeal or anything else. No, no. But he doesn't care. How, what good is the birthright if I'm dying? He's not dying of hunger. He's not in starvation mode. He's just, his blood sugar is probably a little low. He's a little hungry, having been on a hunting uh, expedition all day or for the next, last day or two. He would have lived. I suspect he would have been fine. But he said, no, take it. Give me that bowl. 
a man governed by his appetite. Well, let's apply that spiritually. If it feels good, do it. That's terrible theology. That's being governed by your appetite, coming in and, and say, well, you know, I love chocolate, and here's the healthy oatmeal, but I, I want this chocolate uh, puff. If I eat chocolate puff all the time, I'm going to be puff, okay? And then second, it's not going to be healthy for me. Uh, you have to balance it out. We're, we are to have that self-control in our life, the Holy Spirit helping us to have that control so that we're not indulging and engaging the flesh or any such thing. Then to our self-control is perseverance. That is endurance in doing what is right, not giving in to temptation or to trial. It is staying power. You could look at perseverance being keeping on, keeping on, keeping on. And then the next ingredient we add, because each one builds on the other, you cannot skimp on this. You cannot crimp on this. You cannot skip on this. Or the fruit that you're bearing is not going to be as positive or as healthy. There is godliness. A life that reverence and respects the things of the Lord. A, a fruitful faith is of necessity a God-fearing, God-honoring faith that is conducted in compliance to the Word of God. Years ago, 25 years ago to be precise, 1994 I believe it was, I used to listen, I'd get up early in the mornings and I would listen to a radio program on uh, some channel, I can't remember now, maybe may an 89.1, uh, it was back to the Bible or through the Bible, something to that effect. Woodrow C. Crowell uh, was the guy who was, I think, the announcer. I could be wrong on that, but I, I remember hearing that name a lot. But whoever the announcer was always signed off the same way. Have a good and godly day. Because if it's not good, no, I'm sorry, if it's not godly, what good is it? That has stuck with me for 25 years. Uh, the sense of godliness is always important. And then add to godliness brotherly kindness, a brotherly love, an affection for fellow believers, a church that loves Jesus, loves one another, and reaches out to one another in that spirit of love, saying, you know, there's a song in the, in the hymn book I like, which is the servant song. Uh, Let me be as Christ to you. Let me hold out my hand to you. We are fellow travelers on a journey. That is an awesome Beautiful picture of loving one another so that when that is authentic, then when we tell the community, Jesus loves you and we love you, it's backing up what we say. In other words, if I'm coming in saying, look, I will, I'm going to cook a Mediterranean meatloaf. I'll be on the next British Bake Off. You're not English, British, uh, Brother Moore. Well, we'll find a way around that. All right, so I'm, I'm on that show, and I'm telling them I'm the best baker there is. If I'm able to throw down something that proves it, that's not bragging if you can do it, okay? But if I throw down and it ain't what it, what, what it is claimed to be, then guess what? That's not, that's not going to work. When we say we love Jesus and we, we love others, let us make sure that we are fanned into flame that love for one another in Christ because that will speak volumes. Because then we have credibility. And that is what is needed in a world full of doubt and despondency, a world full of darkness and despair and depravity. Then there is, I think, the most important ingredient. Never can have too much of this ingredient. Now, my grandfather was one of those, and he'd cook chili. <clears throat> First of all, uh, it wasn't chili. It was lava hot. There's a difference. There's, there's hot chili. Then there's the kind that can melt battleship steel. Okay, you know, six-inch plate steel. My grandfather could melt it, okay, with his chili. It was very good. Um, if one teaspoon was good, then a tablespoon was better. I mean, you know, he didn't always use a sense of proportion, and yet his recipes usually turned out very, very delicious. Uh, you get used to things after a while. Well, this is one ingredient you cannot ever have too much of, but it is an ingredient that you can have too little of, and that is love. And we're not talking about this love, oh, I love you, if you love me, or, hey, I love you if you will do something for me, or, hey, I'll do something for you if you do something for me. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a genuine selfless love, a sacrificial love, a love that is like Jesus Christ. The language of the New Testament calls it, and you've heard it before, agape love, that, that Christ love in action. Our love is act of worship. 
and it is an act of worship. And the sequence, each is added to the other in this ingredients of this recipe. Each builds on the other so that our faith is, is strong and therefore our faith becomes fruitful. Our daily technical challenge, not just something we do each Sunday. Uh, we're, we're not in a competition to outdo one another and whoever uh, falls short is eliminated. You're out of here. No, we're not doing that. But the sense of coming together each time saying, you know, look at the victories God gave me and the fruit that God allowed me to bear. Or it may have been times, yeah, I, I face planted that one. I just totally messed, I own it. I messed that one up. And we come together and say, yeah, you did, but you know what? Tomorrow's another day. And God, Jesus, is Lord. And, and we encourage one another. It's that daily passing of the technical challenge. Not only adding the ingredients, but as we close, abounding with the ingredients. 1 Peter 1.8 For if these things are yours not just talk about them, but you actually possess them, and abound, that is, they're overflowing, <clears throat> you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the end result. As we lavishly give our best to apply the ingredients that God has given us, then we find that the fruit is abundant. A fruit-bearing tree or a fruit-bearing vine has value and purpose. It remains useful. And that is how God sees His church. It's not just something that's leafy green. I, I grew tomatoes one year, and I learned quickly that if you didn't pinch off the little suckers, oh, they get leafy green. It's all over the place, but there's no fruit. And yes, tomatoes are fruit, okay? Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. All right? if you, I don't think you've ever had tomato in a fruit salad. I don't think it'd be too good. But tomatoes are fruit, not, not a vegetable, because it's seed-bearing. We could argue that until um, eternity, I suppose, but I'm of the persuasion it's a fruit. So I had to pinch those little suckers off so that the fruit-bearing part of the vine would produce better tomatoes and keep them longer in life. That is what Christ does through the Holy Spirit in our life. What we see in this picture, this end result recipe, is that of developing and enduring, in other words, a keeping on, keeping on, lasting spiritual maturity. One who, because of personal faith in Christ, who knows Christ, is continually and consistently pursuing and practicing that moral excellence that builds up a correct understanding of, of God related to others, and all of that is, is fueled and influenced by His love under the control of the Holy Spirit so that they have staying power in good times and they have staying power in bad times. And it continues to not just produce fruit, but that fruit is presentable. And that fruit is acceptable before God because it's, it, is, it is honoring of God. It becomes what is called in the baking world the showstopper. That is amazing. I have seen some showstoppers in my time. Some have just taken your breath away like, you made that. That is absolutely incredible. Let us make haste to employ then today our best effort for Christ. And our desire, our pursuit, our practice. And in the practice, let us be sure to lavishly apply that which God has given to us. Let us depend on His resource and catalyst. Be lavish to apply what is lavishly supplied by God. Don't scrimp or try to get, don't skimp or crimp on the ingredients or on the timings. It's that daily time in prayer, that daily time in the Word. I didn't say you had to be in, oh, I'm in it for 12 hours. If you can, that's amazing, okay? But can you, can you give God at least 10 minutes? Can you be like he said to Peter and those uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane, could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? Just one hour somewhere and the 24 that God has graciously given you? Pray that we daily yield fruit and continue to mature because as we do so, we honor and glorify God. It is our privilege to take up the technical challenge of developing a fruitful faith and we are set up to succeed in Christ. Are we willing then to pay attention and follow the recipe which is prayer, scripture, and praxis, which is another neat way of saying work. In other words, do the work God has given us. We don't get to pick which ingredients to use. We don't get to pick when we use them because they all go into the mix that produces a fruitful faith. May our fruit 
not only pass God's daily and weekly technical challenge, may it be this day a God-honoring showpiece and showstopper, a, a faith that is bearing fruit even now. But it comes to our moment of invitation because this is the most important moment. The sermon is important, yes, because the Word of God will never come back void. Sermons come and go, but the Word of God endures. The worship part is important. It sets the atmosphere, but this is the most important. This is where you respond. Our camera's turned off. It's just us and God this morning. But if you are led of the Holy Spirit to come to this altar for whatever reason, let nothing stay your hand. I encourage you to come as God leads you this morning. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation, and as, you, as we sing, you come as God leads you to come.